Okay, so we're gonna talk about transfusions here. Um, transfusion, so this is a really important topic, right? Um, it's important to think of a transfusion, think of it like a liquid tissue transplant, right? It's not just IV fluids, we're not just hanging up something that we're putting into the patient. Transfusions, they are not without risks. They are important, and when you have to give it, we give it, but you also need to understand that. So we're gonna talk about some of those things um, right now. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the blood products themselves. We'll go through them. We'll talk about their um, shelf life. How are they stored? I think it's important to know about these things, especially since you know we're type and crossing patients, we're pulling blood. So it's important to understand you know how, where they come from. We're gonna talk about some infections. So we're gonna understand some of the numbers associated with it, what kind of infections these patients can get. If they can get bacteremia from from blood, what's most common. We're also gonna review some major transfusion reactions. We're also gonna talk about some minor reactions and then focus a little bit on the more critical ones as well. So where do blood products come from? Ideally, if we could, we would transfuse patients whole blood, right? That would be nice, just be like, you're bleeding out, we're gonna give you more blood. But the problem with that, there's a couple problems with it. One of the problems is if you do that, you're limited by the component of the blood that has the shortest shelf life, right? And the other problem is, you know, for some patients, if they just need, let's say, a little platelets or a little blood, they may have cardiac problems, CHF, and they can't take that volume, right? So you're giving them all this other stuff they may not need. So what we end up doing then is we end up fractionating it into its components, and this way we can give the patient exactly what they need and we can tailor it to them. So they take the blood, they spin it down, they remove about 80% of the plasma, and that's how we store it. Okay, and this is how we break down the blood products. We have our um, PRBCs, our packed red cells, we have platelets, we have fresh frozen plasma, and we have some cryoprecipitate, and we're gonna talk about each one of these individually. So the most common one that we start with, these are your packed red blood cells. So for packed cells, they have a shelf life of about 21 to 42 days. We store this frozen. The volume is about 250 cc's. So it's important to know that when you're giving a patient a unit or you know, depending on how many units you give. Each unit that you give should increase their hemoglobin by one or the hematocrit by three. Um, so what are some of the indications for transfusion? You can just shout them out. Why are you gonna transfuse a patient? They're bleeding, yeah, of course, they're bleeding, right? So we're gonna give patients blood if they're bleeding. Um, and it's important to understand that the measured H and H, right, your hemoglobin and hematocrit, and the vital signs will lag behind the actual clinical picture of what's going on. So you can't wait for these things. You can't wait for um, like the H and H to, to uh, you know, I guess, find its balance and get the number because it's not gonna be accurate. It'll look higher than it really is. So if your patient's bleeding out, you wanna make sure to give them blood. Why else do we transfuse patients? Symptomatic anemia, right? So our, our typical thresholds for transfusions are usually around seven, but if they're cardiac patients, we may do it a little higher at eight. Um, we used to transfuse, right? I mean, we used to transfuse to like, you know, to 10, then nine, and we keep going down more and more and more. And the reason why is because we realize that giving blood, you know, is not great for patients. We do it if we have to do it, but we used to give, you know, we used to give two units. And how many of you guys have policies now in your hospital where you give one unit and then you reassess? We have, yeah, we have, exactly, I see some hands. We have a, we have a policy, if you try and write for two, you get a warning and it's like, warning, why are you giving two? Why don't you give one and check? And they'll be like, but the hemoglobin's three. Anyway, so, so, we, you know, so we do that. And we give it because we want to increase their O2 carrying capacity. Okay, so platelets. So platelets have a shelf life of five to seven days, and this is stored at room temperature. So this is one of the reasons why we split it, right? Because otherwise we'd be limited by this. And um, the volume is pretty small. It's like 50 to 60 cc's. And you can do, you can transfuse this, um, every, every unit you give or a six pack you give would increase it by 40 to um, 60,000 platelets. Um, so you can do this either, they can either get the platelets from different people and they call that a six pack, or you can get it from a single apheresis and then you just give them a unit. 
So where I used to work, it'd be a six pack, and now they just basically call it a unit. Um, so indications for this. So you're gonna, you're, the indication for this is going to be thrombocytopenia, right? And it's going to be in different settings. So one of those settings, anyone who has platelets less than 10,000, they are getting platelets. Okay, so even if you're, you know, asymptomatic, they're going to get platelets. You know, I always joke around because they'll be like, the platelets are three. And I'll be like, if you can name them, they need more platelets. So, so you want to do that. If they're bleeding, if they have major bleeding, um, and their pl platelets are less than 50,000, it says 20 there, but it's 50,000, you want to give more platelets. And if they have a CNS bleed, and their platelets are less than 100,000, then you want to give them platelets as well. So those are kind of the numbers you want to remember. So FFP. So FFP is basically whole blood minus the red blood cells and the platelets. This contains clotting factors, albumin, immunoglobulins. Um, so the shelf life here is one year. We also store it frozen, and it's good for 24 to 48 hours after you thaw the blood, so after you thaw the, the product. And the volume here is also 250 cc's like the red cells. So um, the indications for emergent transfusion, when do we give FFP? When, when do your, when do your like, procedure list, or when do they ask you to give FFP? When you want to normalize, right, the INR, or normalize it. When you want to decrease the INR, let's say you have to do a procedure and somebody's on warfarin. Okay, if they have a warfarin overdose, and if they're bleeding and they're coagulopathic, that would be another indication. If they have DIC. So something to remember about FFP is the INR of FFP is about 1.2 to 1.5. Right? So if you have somebody and they're like, oh, I'm not going to do this procedure until their INR is 1, give more FFP, you're not going to get it any lower than that. So it's important to know that number. So let's talk about PCCs a little bit. So this is the prothrombin uh, complex concentrates. How many of you guys are using this in your practice now? PCC. So this is rapidly starting to take the place of FFP. And there's many reasons for this. So PCC is a pooled coagulation factor. Um, and there's benefits over FFP. And some of the benefits are um, you don't have to cross-match your patients for this. You don't have to thaw this. It has better efficacy. Um, there's lower volume for transfusion. So that could be good with patients who are fluid overloaded. You get faster INR reversal. Um, there's lower risk for severe allergic reactions, which is always a benefit. And also, they don't contain the active um, clotting factors. So patients don't become thrombotic, which is really nice. So um, some indications for emergent transfusion here, similar to FFP. If you have a patient who's in DIC, they're bleeding out. If they have liver disease, those are some of the reasons. Uh, again, warfarin overdose, some of the reasons you would give PCCs. So cryoprecipitate, so this has a shelf life for about a year, and um, it's stored frozen. This is the cold, insoluble proteins um, factors, namely fibrinogen. This is one of the primary reasons that we're giving this. And the indication here would be if you have a fibrinogen deficiency, and this is you can see in something like a coagulopathic consumption, um, uh, basically like if you had in DIC, right? That might be an indication why you might do cryo. Okay, so um, typing in antibodies, you want to make sure to match the donor with the recipient, right? This is why they banned the patients, and they make sure to check the blood, check the patient's blood, you know, look at the ABO group. Um, in women, we care about the RH, particularly like premenopausal women, right? Because we want to make sure that we're not giving um, like an O-negative patient positive blood because they can have problems in the future with pregnancy and the fetus. O negative is your universal donor. Um, and you can use O positive in males or postmenopausal women. And obviously for women, if you're, if you're not so sure, because sometimes they're trauma and they come in as a Jane Doe, you want to just go for O negative. And O negative does not contain the blood antigen group. And they, hence, that's why you're the universal donor. So let's talk a little bit about infection and uh, transmission rates. So in general, up to 20% of transfusions can have some kind of reaction. Most of the reactions are mild, um, but some can be life-threatening, and we're going to start to talk about that. 
So the risk of HIV and hepatitis C is about one in two million. So the blood banks, um, and when you, know, you go to the Red Cross or you donate blood, they do really, really strict screening of this blood, right? So even before you sit down and you start donating, if you've answered any of these questions, they're just like, you know, they, they kick you right out, right? So they're already screening you, and then they're also testing the blood uh, to the best of their abilities. You can get bacterial sepsis, and you can get it from Yersinia, and because this can be, this can, uh, be grow in <coughs> refrigerated blood, so this is something to be concerned about there. But the risk of bacteremia is 1 in 500,000 for RBCs and 1 in 40,000 for platelets. Okay, so we're just going to do a little summation here of, of what we just talked about, and then we're going to move on to do some cases. So again, packed cells, so increases your hemoglobin by 1, okay, or your hematocrit by 3. Indications is to increase O2 carrying capacity if patients are, you know, um, symptomatic anemia or if they're acutely bleeding out. Remember that the vital signs and the h and will lag behind the clinical picture, so keep that in mind. Platelets, each six-pack or unit increases your platelets by 40 to 60,000. Um, indications, the numbers you want to remember are 10, 50, and 100. If you're asymptomatic, less than 10,000. If you're bleeding, less than 50,000. And if you have a CNS bleed, less than 100,000. So FFP, the indications here are bleeding with some kind of coagulopathy um, or coagulation deficiency, liver disease, um, you know, if somebody's on uh, warfarin, you have to do a procedure or something like that. And then remember, you also have PCCs that you can do. And then with transfusions, just remember, you want to talk about risk-benefit with patients. So this is why it's important to know some of this information. And we're going to go on now, and we're going to talk about some of the adverse events, so you'll also talk about that with your patients. Okay, so case number one. All right, so we got a guy. Guy comes in. All right, and we're giving him some uh, blood products, and then his temp goes up a little bit, okay? He's a little bit febrile. So we're like, all right, what does this patient have, right? So they have febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. So this is, this is, as far as reactions go, this one is not too bad. So um, this occurs, it can occur during or up to four hours after transfusion. It's a pretty low incidence, about like 0.1 to 1% of transfusions. Um, and the, the thought here, you get a low-grade temp, but it's otherwise you're pretty asymptomatic. They think it's cytokine-mediated. There's higher risk in older blood and older platelets. And if you leukoreduce these products, then um, the incidence drops. And the treatment here is basically an antipyretic, so you can give some acetaminophen. Okay, case number two. So we got a guy, all right? We give the guy some blood product. We see a pattern forming here. Okay, so this guy is starting to get a rash, but otherwise, no other symptoms and vital signs are otherwise stable. Okay, so what is this guy getting here? This guy's basically getting a simple allergic reaction, right? Just some simple urticaria, so not too bad. So this can occur, again, during or a few hours after. The incidence here is a little bit, like, all over the place. Um, but it's about, uh, about 1 to 3%. Um, so this, if, if somebody's getting this, it's not unreasonable to treat these patients and to continue on with the allergic reaction, but you want to watch them carefully, right, because you want to make sure that this is a simple allergic reaction, not something more severe or more concerning. Um, you know, they say here you could premedicate if a known history is the same, but that's actually not true, and we're going to talk about why that's not the case, and there's some data to suggest that we really shouldn't be doing these for patients. Okay, so case number three here. All right, we got another guy. Where'd all the women go? That's what I want to know. So we got another guy. Um, we give him some blood products. Okay, so now this patient, this patient's starting to look real sick. So their temperature's going up, right? They're 39.5, they're getting shocky, and they're looking like garbage. Okay, and there you go. So what does this person have? And it could be, and, and this could be a couple things, so you know, you can, you can guess. What do you think? What's the bad one? Okay, so acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. 
right? This is the one that we all fear. This is like the ABO incompatibility. This is the scary, scary one. This patient could also be septic, okay? They could also be infected. You could have given them infected blood, and now they're getting sick from that. So sometimes it's hard to differentiate bet between the two, and that's why sometimes we're going to go broad here. Okay, so in this case, this can again occur during transfusion or up to four hours after. This is a true emergency. This is when you're like, holy crap, okay, what is happening here? So what's the first thing you want to do in this situation? First thing, stop, right, stop the blood. In fact, in most of these situations, just stop the blood, right? Get a sense of what's going on, stop the blood, and then think, right? You don't want to, like, think and keep infusing, so stop the blood and think. This is pretty rare, one in about 40 to 70,000. The mor mortality is one in 30. And again, this is usually due to ABO incompatibility. And the recipient antibodies induce hemolysis in the donor RBCs. So this is really bad, usually due to human error. And this can lead to DIC, shock, acute renal failure, death. Okay? So that's why it's really important to know about this. So symptoms here, you can get a high-grade fever. You can get flank pain, back pain, you can get hematuria, headaches, altered mental status. Um, these patients get really sick. You can see abnormal vital signs, okay? So if that's happening, you really want to have a high clinical suspicion for this. How do we diagnose it? Send some blood down to the lab. What they're going to do is they're going to spin it down. They're going to look at the plasma. What should plasma look like? It should be clear, right? Yellow clear, right? It should be clear. This one's not clear. This one looks pink. And the reason why is because of the hemolysis. Um, and so you also want to sec uh, send a direct uh, Coombs test as well. So we already talked about what we want to do, right? You guys said stop. Stop the transfusion, okay? You want to recheck the patient, recheck the blood, notify the blood bank, all right? And then we're going to send, you can send some blood work down again, retype and cross the patient, send a direct Coombs test, chemistry panel, and hemoglobin. Okay, so treatment here. So treatment is supportive. So the severity of the reaction is going to be proportional to the amount of blood that you gave the patient, which is why the first thing you want to do is stop it. The other interesting thing is that when they are transfusing a patient, for the first 30 minutes of the transfusion, they give it really slow. And there's a reason why they give it really slow, right? They give it slow because they want to make sure that the patient's not having a reaction. You know, obviously, if your patient is crumping and you're giving uncrossed, you know, blood, you're just giving it. But in an ideal situation, you would give it slowly. So um, you want to do supportive care. Give them lots of IV fluids. You want to keep flushing out their kidneys. Okay, you want to maintain their uh, urine output, 100 to 200 cc's per hour. And then remember, they're hemolyzing, right? They're lysing all of their cells, and so they can get hyperkalemic. So these patients should be on the monitor. You can certainly do an EKG. If you're seeing changes, you know, treat the hyperkalemia for sure, but then continue to monitor their morphology to make sure they're not having any myocardial instability. Okay, so what else could this patient be having? This patient could also be septic, okay? They, if, if you have a septic, septic patient, you're going to see the same thing. You're going to see them have a fever. You're going to see them, you know, look shocky and get sick and become hypotensive. So this can happen too. It is very rare, but you're going to do the same thing. You're going to stop the transfusion. You're going to notify the blood bank. They're going to culture the blood, but they're also going to culture um, the patient's blood and the blood that they are transfusing, okay? It's really important to do that. And, um, and then you're going to give broad-spectrum antibiotics. So sometimes it's going to be hard to differentiate between whether a patient is having um, a hemolytic reaction or that initially. So if you give broad-spectrum antibiotics, I would say that this is the one situation that nobody's going to like yell at you about your antibiotic stewardship. <coughs> okay, case number four. All right, oh, there we go, Miley Cyrus. I think she just performed yesterday. Okay, so we're giving her some blood, and she's having trouble be breathing, and she looks really uncomfortable. Okay, big change here, right? All right, so what could this patient have? What could be happening here? What do you think? Anaphylaxis, yeah, the patient can certainly be having anaphylaxis. There's a couple things that could be having, happening here. They could be having a severe anaphylactic reaction, okay? 
right? It's your oh crap moment. Um, they could be having a transfusion-related acute lung injury, trolley, or they could be having a transfusion-associated circulatory overload, taco, okay? So there's a couple things, and we're going to talk about how to differentiate between which one is which, okay? And once you know it, then it'll be easier to figure out. All right, so severe allergic reaction, anaphylaxis. This is kind of our bread and butter stuff, right? So we, we're a little bit more comfortable with this. We know how to treat this um, more easily. So this can occur during the transfusion or, again, up to four hours afterwards. And one in 20,000 to 50,000 patients, these patients can get shock, hypotension, right? They can get angioedema, respiratory distress. Um, if you do a chest x-ray, it could be normal. Have any of you guys seen a patient that looks like this? Yeah, this is terrible, right? This is like frightening. I had a patient like this when I was in residency once, and I remember I was like, oh God, oh God. I was like, okay, we gotta intubate, we gotta intubate, right? And I, so I'm talking to the guy, and I'm like, okay, sir. I was like, we're gonna put a tube in, right? And we were gonna try and do like an awake fiber optic nasal intubation. And I'm trying to explain this to him, and the guy just keeps going, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. And I was like, okay, sir, well, you can die. I was like, this will close your airway and you will die, and he's like, uh-uh, and he goes like this, and then on his paper, he writes, do not intubate me. This is a young guy. This guy is 24 years old, and I'm just like, oh, man, so I say to the guy, I go, okay, I'll tell you what. I was like, I will not intubate you, but when you pass out, I will intubate you, and the guy was like, okay, right, <laughs> and then fortunately, you know, we gave him some epi, and his, his swelling came down. We gave him some steroids, and I was like, Whew, but that was a close one, and that guy looked just like this, and it was terrifying. Okay, so initial actions here, again, stop the transfusion, give supportive measures, right? We're going to give epi. Now, out of these choices, sub-Q, IM, IV, which one are we not going to do? Sub-Q, right? We talked about this before. We're not giving epi sub-Q, right? The absorption is variable. We're not going to do that. But you can give it IM or you can give it IV, okay? We're also going to give this patient steroids. We can give an H2 blocker. We're going to give them IV fluids. We're going to give them lots of supportive care. Try to get them turned around, right? If necessary, we'll put in a breathing tube. So trolley here. Um, so this occurs uh, during or up to six hours afterwards. So the incidence, I mean, this is like all over the place, right? So we don't really know exactly how many patients get this. So the pathophysiology here, they think it involves HLA antibodies. And the thought is that um, there's granulocyte and antibody deposition within the lung. Okay, so that, that gives you this kind of picture. It's more common in female patients and um, less so in males. So diagnosis here. Okay, so this gives you a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. These patients will be tachypneic, tachycardic. The key here is these patients will be hypotensive, okay? So I, that's how I want you to remember. Trolley, I want you to circle hypotension there. You can get frothy pink sputum, fever. This is what the chest x-ray looks like. I mean, you know, it looks pretty, pretty terrible. Okay, and treatment here is, again, stop the transfusion, supportive, and these patients you're not going to give Lasix. That's not hard to remember. How many of us are giving, like, hypotensive patients Lasix, you know, when they look like this? Not really, right? So not, not that hard to remember. All right, now let's talk about TACO. Um, so TACO, this, again, can occur, occur during or a few hours afterwards, and this is the transfusion-associated circulatory overload. Okay, so this, the incidence here is variable, but increase in patients with CHF, and it's similar to trolley. The difference here is that these patients are going to be hypertensive, so circle that, right? I mean, you think about it, right? Anyone who's going to, like, eat a lot of tacos all the time, fluid overloaded, hypertensive, so maybe that's how we can remember it. And, hey, look, we know that guy, right? We saw him at the other lecture. Um, so he's got the JVD, incre increased blood pressure, increased BNP. Chest x-ray also looks pretty crappy. And this, we're going to do the same. Supportive care, stop the transfusion, give this pa patient some Lasix. You can give these patients non-invasive positive pre pressure ventilation as well. Okay, we're going to talk for a minute about pre-medication because I promised we would. So are we going to pre-medicate these patients? So here's one study. This looked at about 315 Hemong patients receiving blood products. They compared placebo versus pre-medication with acetaminophen and diphenhydramine. They found no difference in the transfusion reaction. In fact, their previous study also didn't support this practice, even in patients who've had two or more of these reactions in the past. And it turns out it doesn't really make a difference. 
The thing that wasn't studied was will this have an effect on the severity of the transfusion reaction? So that I can't tell you, but I can tell you that it's not currently recommended. So they're saying some theoretical pros and cons, but really we shouldn't do it. If people have this reaction, you can consider giving uh, leukocyte reduced blood. So key points here. If you suspect an acute transfusion reaction, stop the transfusion, recheck the patient and blood identifiers, notify the blood bank. Okay, if severe, you can send labs as well. You're going to send your direct cooms. You're going to retype and screen the patient. Chemistry, you can send LDH. You know, the, you're probably not going to be able to look at the plasma, but they will down in the lab, and they'll probably let you know. And you can check for blood in the urine and blood cultures if you're worried about sepsis. Okay, so now we're just going to go through this a little bit and talk about each of these elements here. And we're going to go through, it's like, we'll, we'll do a little review. Okay. So patient has a low-grade fever. Okay, so if they have a low-grade fever, um, what do we think they have? Right, well, they have the febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, okay? And what are we going to treat it with? Antipyretics. Okay, what about isolated urticaria? What do these people have? Yeah, right, that's right. So they have a simple allergic reaction, that's right. Okay, and how are we going to treat these patients? going to give them a little Benadryl. That's right, a little antihistamine. Okay, so now we have a patient with high fever and shock. So what could these patients have? That's right, absolutely. They could have an acute hemolytic um, transfusion reaction or they can have sepsis, okay? And for the acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, um, and actually both of them, you can give them antipyretics. You might need to give them some pressors um, for support. You want to give them lots of IV fluids, you know, keep their kidneys going, and give them antibiotics, okay? I mean, if you're trying, sometimes it's going to be really hard to tell the difference up front. I think the harm of giving them a dose of antibiotics is minimal in this situation, so I would do it. These patients are really sick. Okay, so respiratory... Now you have a patient with respiratory distress, okay? So what if I tell you they're hypotensive? What do you think they have? Right, trolley, yeah. They could be anaphylaxis or they could have trolley, exactly. Okay, so trolley, you're going to see the non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, okay? Supportive care, you don't have to give these patients Lasix. Anaphylaxis, they can have wheezing, rash, they're going to have a clear chest x-ray, and you're going to treat them accordingly. Epi, steroids, right? If you have to, you give pressors, protect their airway, like you would do with any anaphylactic reaction. Okay, what about if the patient is hypertensive? What do they have? Yeah, they have taco. That's right, okay? So these patients you can give Lasix to, and you're going to do the same basic support um, otherwise. And with that, I thank you guys very much. This is my last lecture. You guys have been wonderful. Thank you.